And um, uh, this is a really a story about eelgrass and climate variability and how that might force eelgrass variability. So once again, an ecologist is elucidating the obvious. Okay, but uh, we're taking advantage of some long-term data sets. Let's see. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. How do I fix that? That's the forward. So uh, the main messages are that um, variations in climatic force for Conditions force temporal and spatial variability in eelgrass. Who, do, who does not know where the eelgrass is? It's a flowering plant that occurs in the shallow waters, and there's seagrass. It's one of 60 species of seagrass worldwide. It's the most widespread of and successful of species uh, worldwide, and it's very important for our ecosystem. And it's actually a goal of restoration in Puget Sound. Uh, trends in water and level and temperature forced by climatic. Oceanic conditions can be mechanistically connected to variation in eelgrass here. Uh, there have been global losses that have been doc documented in a couple of publications. Uh, some of those losses are blamed on, blamed on human impacts. And there's plans to restore eelgrass in Puget Sound in many places in the world. Uh, but we really need to consider these natural variability when, in the, in, when we put uh, restoration in context. So the study sites here, I'm talking about three study sites. Uh, Squim Bay, which is near our lab, Clinton uh, Ferry Terminal, which is in central Puget Sound, a large outer coast estuary, Willapa Bay. And I'm also going to talk about a site here in the San Juans where uh, Westcott Bay that had a wink out of about uh, 40 acres of eelgrass in the early uh, 2000s. And so I'm going to talk a lot about sea level. And of course, whoops. Uh, about sea level. And uh, of course, we have these extreme events uh, that are short term where you have this is the predicted sea level and this is the actual sea level because of these winds forcing that. Now, this is Toke Point, which is at the mouth of Willapa Bay. And those are interesting and those are important. Uh, but also, we have long term variations in sea level. This is uh, from Port Angeles near Squim, and this shows uh, the deviation from the long term mean. And what you see during the Ansel event, uh, the last part of the, the last part of the last century, is that uh, it, you can get a mean uh, sea level that's 30 centimeters higher than the long-term average during the, this is 1997, 98, and then it drops to about 15 centimeters below uh, the long-term mean. So that's about a half a meter drop, which is a huge deal for nearshore organisms that depend on water and being covered and things like that. And uh, it's important. So what? 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 So what? Well, this is the de depth distribution of eelgrass here. There's about 2,000 points. Uh, the the clear circles are Puget Sound, and the dark circles Willapa Bay. And this is Coos Bay here. And you can see that light gets limiting as you go deeper. I guess my thumb is too big. That's a problem. Maybe I'll just. I know what I'll do. I'll just. Uh, and uh, desiccation stress. They don't like to dry out, so that limits the upper distribution. Why this is so uh, confined here, both in Coos Bay and Willapa Bay, is because they're really turbid. They can't go very deep. And so, I, and I, why uh, Coos Bay is higher here, I think, is because during the spring and summer, it's really cold and foggy yeah. and, uh, there, and maybe a reason why it can distribute itself further up. So this is very important. So if you move sea level up, you're going to affect the lower depth distribution. If you move it down, you're going to affect the upper distribution. So that's, that's kind of the theory here. And we've done a lot of work looking at things like desiccation stress and leaf growth. And as you get more uh, desiccation stress, the growth goes down quite a bit. And temperature affects it, too, because they just don't like to dry out. And the respiration rate goes up a lot. And this is pho photosynthesis and respiration experiments we've done. Each one of these is a mean of five uh, replicates. So a lot of data. And what we found is kind of interesting that actually the fastest growth rates uh, really occur starting about five to seven degrees C, which is winter conditions, okay? And the variation this way is because there's different light intensities. These were all done in natural light. So uh, there was light limitation in this case. And if you look at respiration rate, it's really fine up in uh, these cooler temperatures, but it really starts to get high, uh, affect respiration rates. And if you look at the photosynthesis to respiration ratio, 
it's, uh, it, it, the maximum is around seven degrees C, which means they really love cold water. If you give them a little bit of, uh, of light, they'll just take off like crazy. So they're really cold adapted, low light adapted plants. Uh, so we're trying to figure out if there's some connection with climate variability and eelgrass. And so we, I started looking at, a, I've experimented with a lot of uh, indices. I've settled on this oceanic Nino index, which has to do with sea surface temperature in the uh, Nino 3.4 region near the equator. And uh, this is, they have a 30 record, year record of uh, that index. It has to do basically with temper vari temperature variation. This is the neutral ONI. And this is the mean sea level anomaly during this period at Port Angeles. And you can see that when, in, during warmer periods here, this would be 1997 area, you have higher sea levels. And during, the surprising thing is during cooler uh, periods, you have higher sea levels. Well, this, this is thermal expansion of the ocean. I've read this, now please correct me. Uh, it's thermal expansion of the ocean, plus a lot of rainfall in the southwest tropical Pacific that raises the sea level too. And this is due to actually, whoops, uh, rainfall in the northwest here. So it's, it's kind of a curvilinear thing. So there is, a, there is a relationship between O and I and mean sea level. Okay, this Willapop Bay, it's a uh, big bay. It's got a lot of eelgrass on the flats here. We studied six sites arrayed, arrayed throughout the bay. In 1998 through ni for 2001, which turned out to be the answer of the century. Um, hate to do that kind of thing, but anyway. It was kind of fortuitous. What we saw was huge changes between 98 and 2001. The sea level was higher in 2008, or, or 1998, which if you remember the distribution, that would affect the photosynthesis of the plants. And what we found is the sea level dropped, whoops. As the sea level dropped, the uh, above ground biomass, for example, went from 20 grams per square meter to 120 grams per square meter. The flowering increase, which may be a, a response to disturbance, uh, shoot density increased to a certain point where it may, may have been come, become uh, a density dependent issue. So the huge changes uh, may be related to sea level variation and possibly temperature. And if you just uh, calculate the number of shoots, the total shoot abundance in Willapaw Bay, it's, it's a dramatic increase in the carrying capacity of that bay over this period of time. This is the Clarenton Ferry Terminal. We've done a lot of restoration of eelgrass there, but these are, uh, these are reference plots. This would be a deep plot, A, E is an intermediate depth, and B is a shallow plot, over 10 years of monitoring. We, if you plot the density, the mean density, for plot A, plot E, and plot B, you can see that there's a variation relative to the O and I. And during coolest periods and warmest periods, they had the lowest densities, and intermediate had the highest densities. So that's a lot of variation, much more than the 20% that we're trying to restore in Puget Sound. So, and that, uh, you, there's, a, there's a pretty flaky relationship between O and I and the Gedney, water, Gedney Island water temperature, which is a Department of Ecology water monitoring site, but there is some relationship there. Okay, this is a study site in, in Squim Bay, and this is our laboratory, so we can just walk right out here, 100 giant steps, and we're there. And we've been studying that uh, almost every summer since 1991, the growth rates with interns. They come and you're going to measure growth rate, learn how to do primary productivity studies. So it's been really good. And this is a sampling site. This is the one we always use uh, every time we go out in the summer. And this is how we do it. They punch a little hole in the, in the leaves, through the, all the leaves here. And then they go come back two weeks and they gather up the plants and then they uh, find out the growth relative to a piece of the plant that didn't grow, and then they cut that off and dry and weigh it. So you get a nice measure of net primary productivity. It's really, it's really, and it has a pretty low variance. We often measure uh, photosynthetically active radiation and temperature along with these measurements. And this uh, just shows the growth rate uh, throughout the year, done mostly in the summer, but this shows that actually the plants are growing in the wintertime when there's hardly any light getting to them. That's because they're using the carbohydrate reserves that they got in the last summer. Plus, they do react to, we, we know we'll get a sunny period in February, and they love that, and they'll just take off growing really quickly. And they grow fastest in May, and then they drop down in summer, probably because temperatures increase and respiration increase, because the low tides are occurring during summer, uh, uh, during the day in the summer. But there's a lot of variance over the years, uh, from 14 to 2. Uh, so I wanted to look at that more closely. 
And this is, this is the summer growth rates from 1991 through 2013. We have 2014, but I didn't plot it here. This is the long-term mean here. And you can see that it's all over the place. This is 97. Uh, this is 2013. This is 2001. Uh, so it's all over the place. And uh, relating it to the ONI, you can see there is this kind of variability here. And so that got to be pretty intriguing. And uh, this is this is the uh, this is the uh, mean sea level anomaly at Port Angeles. This is a five-month running mean. Of course, this is 1997, and this is a smooth curve. And this show this has a similar variance as I showed you before with the ONI. But I'm just thinking there's something's going on here. There's a stable period here that we had the Ansel event and it dropped down, and then I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, that's there's something going on. Actually, a lot of things happened around here in Puget Sound. Uh, the eelgrass winked out in several places. Uh, we got more hypoxic, more frequent hypoxic events in Hood Canal, and uh, we had huge uh, nuisance algal blooms in 97, 98, 99. So there was maybe a, a semi-regime shift at that period. I'm just putting that out. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so this, remember in the olden days you had the overheads. You could just put one down, put another one on top of it, and uh, compare. So that's what I've done here. And uh, basically, this is the O&I, which is in the diamonds, relative to the growth rates. And it's pretty good correspondence uh, between the growth rates, except for a couple of places. Uh, 1994, which I have no idea why. But 2013, I talked to Nick Bond last night, and he said, well, you know, 2013 and 14 were really weird years in terms of temperature and things like that, and we really should look deeper. So there's a lot more to sort out here uh, in this variability. Uh, but anyway, it looked pretty like pretty good concordance uh, to us. Okay, finally, I'm talk about uh, uh, Westcott Bay. Um, this place winked out, as I mentioned, 40 acres winked out. Uh, so Lyle Hibbler did some modeling using Delft three. If you change sea level, mean sea level, what would happen to the current magnitudes? And they do increase quite a bit in this in this one point where a lot of eelgrass winked out. And also the bottom stress changes too, and that's just something else we need to consider because that really affect, affects bottom metabolism and uh, things like that. So uh, anyway, that's just uh, just a just a point I want to make. So uh, well, so substantial interannual uh, variation in eelgrass density, abundance, and growth is common in the Northwest. Uh, oceanic conditions appear to have significant or to be significant drivers. Plans to restore eelgrass must consider the natural variation. You know, give, give restoration efforts a break. If things aren't working good this year, it may be a bad year for eelgrass transplants. Wait, you know, take an aspirin, call me in a year, and you'll be okay. Um, climate change uh, will probably have an effect on eelgrass abundance. It's pretty clear from that. It's, we're getting to a point where we can develop a, perhaps a predictive capability. We do have a model that we're, we're using to find areas to restore your grass in Puget Sound that could be to used to look at climate uh, effects. Ecosystem services, of course, I didn't talk about that, but if you take a beach stain through your grass, you may pick up 50 to 70 species of fish and invertebrates. It's just packed with species, so it's very, very important to the ecosystem. And uh, so as it varies, so does things like juvenile salmon and herring and other things, that varies too. And globally, this may be of interest to you, as new paper by Forkman et al. Uh, that reviewed seagrasses globally, and they store about 20 petagrams of organic carbon in the sediment, which is significant. It's a, it's a, it's a good chunk of the ocean storage, and um, they can't be ignored. Of course, if you're losing seagrasses, that's a big deal. Uh, what became clear to me is long-term ecological monitoring is rare but cr critical to looking at patterns. We just don't have enough of it, and uh, again, the predictive capability is possible. So I want to acknowledge that actually the conference organizers, this has been a great conference for me. I've learned a whole lot, and uh, all the students that worked with us and the funding agencies, we had a little funding to do this. Mostly it was uh, through uh, student programs funded by the Department of Energy, our colleagues, uh, peer review. Keith Merkel, a colleague, actually su suggested early on looking at sea level variations. You know, uh, this is an unabashed uh, advertisement for the Coastal Estuarine Research Federation meeting in Portland in November 2015. The, grand, uh, the theme is Grand Challenges in Coastal and Estuarine Science, of which climate change is a huge, big deal. And uh, workshop and session proposals are due on Friday. Uh, 
but and it's just a paragraph and a title paragraph and a suggested speakers. And I really encourage you to to submit to that. I'm a, one of the co-chairs for the conference, and uh, it should be really good. Portland's a really cool place to have it, and uh, it, it'll be usually about 1,500 people come. It's probably one of the most important uh, meetings uh, on coastal science, you know, in the world. So it's uh, I, I hope you can come. Anyway, thank you. All right, we have time for some questions. Um, could you, thank you very much. That was a very clear and um, beautiful presentation. It was kind of like, for most of us working with the coastal region and, oh, b by the way, are you working with EcoTrust in Portland on this? The no. Fisher Center? No. Okay, very good. Um, on the uh, eelgrass, uh, have you done studies um, about the uh, energy, the CO2 retention of um, aquatic shoreline grasses being almost like 90, 100% more um, nutrient intensive for CO2 retention, energy retention than anything on landmass or terrestrial, and um, kind of harnessing that for um, atmosphere, oxygen, cleansing this kind of things like chemtrails? Yeah, you know, we did, we did work a little bit. We've done work on uh, carbon storage and, and we have some carbon data for the sediments, but also we did, uh, did you know, we dosed eel grass and kelp with uh, uh, advanced uh, levels of CO2 and they both responded. Uh, they're both C3 plants and they both responded positively. So they like CO2 and they, they definitely can be a, uh, a carbon sink. Uh, and what we haven't worked out is where, you know, where it goes, what, what pools it goes into, how much is exported out, what happens to the exports. So that needs to be worked out. But uh, people are restoring them as uh, CO2 to, you know, to take up CO2 and sequester it as mitigating that. So, and they do, you know, they, they uh, also will affect the uh, ocean acidity too, quite a bit, you know, diurally and long term. Yeah. All right, one more question. Yeah. So what's the best That's that 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 would be the obvious thing, yeah. And have you any Yeah, I mean they should it should be independent but close and it within the same kind of general region. So they're experiencing the same general oceanographic and light conditions. That's probably the main thing. Yeah, the, so the reference sites are really it. And then you know, take a look at I mean so that's the stuff we're learning here about the uh, interannual variability in, in forcing factors, that, you know, you gotta take that as a line of evidence when you're evaluating the results of your restoration project. 